The two-minute message preview at the non-denominational New Hope is From Hopeless to Hopeful Part 2. One of the most popular books on the Christian bestseller list is The Prayer of Jabez. The book was written by Bruce Wilkerson and published in 2000. We know very little about Jabez, except that he was more honorable than his brothers and that his mother named him Jabez because she was in great pain at his birth. His name means pain. As for Jabez, he was well-intentioned, wealthy, and famous, he was a man of prayer. His prayer was straightforward and short, he only used 33 words, but his prayer got God's attention, and God granted him what he requested. The best honor that any man can have is to have a relationship with God, and Jabez did, and he has his prayer recorded in the Word of God because it is significant and instructive for us to know what he prayed. So, here is the question. Are you living the life God wants you to live, or are you just living life? God wants you to live a life of blessing. In the Old Testament, we discover Jabez, who moved beyond living a life of everyday blessing to abundant blessing. His name appears only three times in the Bible, in two verses, and in the long list of the genealogies, the who begat whose. Significantly, what Jabez is remembered for is not some outstanding achievement but a prayer. But out of all the people in this nine-chapter list of characters, he alone is lifted out because of the prayer that he prayed. It is significant that what Jabez is remembered for is not some outstanding achievement, but a prayer. He did not win a great battle or erect a great building. He simply prayed a prayer. He is like a shining star in this long list of anonymous characters. But out of all the people in this nine-chapter list of characters, he alone is lifted out because of the prayer that he prayed. In his weekend message, Pastor Dell will elaborate on Jabez's short prayer and the four things he prayed for. His prayer can become a model for us to use in our own prayer life. For the rest of the story, here is Pastor Dell. We are in this mini-series on prayer, and uh, today we're talking about the uh, prayer of Jabez. This is part two uh, in this uh, mini-series on the prayer life of Jabez. Jabez was once a man without any hope, and then uh, he grew to become a man full of hope. 
How in the world did he do it? Well, he did it through prayer. And we're going to be talking about that today in today's message. And so our foundational verse for this entire uh, series of messages is found in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 1. And here's what it says. Therefore, I exhort, first of all, that supplication, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, what does that teach us, folks? Very simple. It teaches us before we do anything, we need to pray first. Before we do anything, we need to pray first. And so here's the question. Are you living the life that God intends for you to live, uh, to be a blessing to other people? Or are you just kind of passing through life, just living life? Well, I tell you what, folks, uh, the crux of today's message is God wants you to live a life of blessing so that you can bless other people. Now, folks, next Sunday, I'm beginning a new series on the end times. I don't know if you realize it or not, but I firmly believe, and other Bible scholars agree with me, that we are living in the latter days. We are living in the end times. And uh, to give credence to that uh, comment, uh, just read Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24 is the end times chapter. And so I think it's pretty obvious, folks, that we are in a desperate place as a nation and as a world. It's pretty obvious uh, uh, that we are there at this strategic time. Uh, the historians call it the late decadence. And it's just really where we are, folks. We are, we are actually morally bankrupt. We are in a moral decline. And uh, everything uh, that once was ungodly is now on the rise. And everything that is godly is now on the decrease. What once was wrong is now right. And what was once right, well, it's now wrong. And all you have to do is look at the news and you will discover that the Christians, Christianity, is being persecuted uh, by the world in which we live. I read this recently from a renowned historian, and he said that in 500 years of recorded history, there have been 26 cycles of human history that have pretty much always uh, repeated themselves. And we as a nation are right on track uh, to be in that same place where once you get here, there's never been a society that has ever recovered from where we are. And that's the bad news, folks. But God is still in control. That's the good news. So we are there at that place of late decadence and most of the empires and most of the civilizations that rise to power and kind of did what we are doing and where we are, uh, they all kind of lost their way and about the, at about the same age, at about around 240 years. And so if you read your history and uh, read your church history, uh, you will discover that nations like the Egyptians, the Persians, the Trojans, the Greeks, the Romans, and the British, any empire that you study, they all lose their power and they never recover from it. But at the beginning, they actually... Uh, were succeeding and they were doing things right. And whenever we do things right, then we s succeed. But then when we start doing things wrong, then we begin to uh, get pulled back into bondage. And a lot of times, 
These nations that I have talked about, they never recover. And they were conquered, not by an external enemy, but they all imploded and rotted from within. And so here's a quote recently by the founder of Dubai, and his name is Sheikh Rashid, and he's concerned about his nation as well as we are concerned about our nation. And I read this quote from him. Listen closely. Here's what he said. He says, my grandfather rode a camel and my father rode a camel and I ride a Mercedes and my son rides a Land Rover and my grandson is going to ride a Land Rover. But my great grandson is going to have to ride a camel again. Why is that? He was asked and his reply was, hard times create strong men. Strong men create easy times. Easy times create weak men. Weak men create difficult times. Many will not be able to understand this, but you have to raise warriors, not parasites. And he goes on to say, add to the historical reality that all great empires, the Persians, Trojans, Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, and later the British, all rose and then perished within 240 years. And they were not conquered by external enemies. They all rotted from within. And so the question of the day, folks, really is, what are we going to do about that? Well, again, we have good news that we can use, and the Bible has an answer for that. It's found in 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14, and here's what it says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, you know, folks, I'm sure you have read that verse many, many times. And the most important word in that verse is the very first one. If. It's like God's up in heaven saying, well, if. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, you know, folks, this verse is our hope. And everybody knows that inherently. I mean, you know it. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in church or you probably wouldn't be watching this message today. But uh, uh, I believe that um, we know that head knowledge but do we really believe it? And I have learned over the years that most people have to overcome a hurdle when it comes to prayer. A lot of us are inspired to pray, but a lot of us simply do not know how to pray. And that's the hurdle that we have to overcome. We simply don't know how to pray. So you find your moment uh, in your quiet time uh, with God. That's what it's called, quiet time. And actually, <laughs> it really is quiet time because we just run out of words. We don't know how to pray. And so we've got to understand the five P's of prayer. And I'm going to give you these five P's of prayer before we get into the prayer of Jabez. Most people, prayer is not their first response, it's their last resort. Well, you know, we've tried everything else, might as well pray about it. That's the wrong attitude, folks. We should make prayer our first priority. And the five P's, I'm going to give them to you. Number one, um, is the 
priority of prayer. The priority of prayer. Look what the Bible says in Mark chapter 1, verse 35. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. He prayed in the morning, and he made it a priority. So I want to encourage you to make prayer a priority, just like Jesus did. The second P that we have is the place of prayer. Notice again in Mark 1, 35, uh, he left his ho the house and went off to a solitary place. Oftentimes, Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had a place uh, to pray. Now, why is it that, uh, that uh, I always start with the letter, the same letter, uh, here, here again, I use the same letter for all five P's of prayer. Why is that? Well, I guess it's simply because, like a lot of pastors, uh, we have the uh, preacher's disease. I don't know why we do it, but it kind of makes it easier to follow along with the message. So, we have the priority of prayer and the place of prayer. Notice that he went to a solitary place. And so, now the third P that we need to have in our plan of, of prayer is the, the, uh, is, the, uh, is the plan of prayer. We need to have a plan. We have the prioritizing of prayer. We have the place of prayer. Now we need to have a plan. And all through the Bible, folks, there are models of prayer. There are prayers that have a certain order to them. In fact, many of them have the same order. And uh, when Jesus taught his disciples how to pray in Matthew chapter 6, he wasn't teaching them a prayer. He was teaching them a plan for prayer. Jesus is not teaching us to pray. He's teaching that he's giving us a plan for prayer. And so if you study the, ra the rabbis, rabbis were the teachers and the days of Jesus, these rabbis, they always taught from an outline. Well, maybe that's why I teach from an outline. I've often been accused of not being a, a preacher, but they say, Dale, you are a teacher, and I find myself in good company because Jesus uh, was called a good teacher. And so I teach from the out an outline just like the rabbis did in the days of Jesus. And so... When the disciples uh, came to Jesus in Luke chapter 11, verses, uh, verses 2 through 4, uh, he wasn't giving his disciples a 22nd prayer. He was giving them, if you dissect this section of Scripture, he was giving them seven elements of the plan to pray. Look how it goes. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread. In other words, spend time worshiping God, hallowing his name, uh, praising him for the attributes that he has. Then spend time on the kingdom coming and his will be done. And then spend some time uh, with uh, your needs. And then uh, give us this day our daily bread. And then he moves into and forgive us our sins. That's when we come clean uh, before God. We also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then uh, here is where we get our heart cleansed. Wash me, Lord, and I shall be whiter than snow. And help me, Lord, to learn to forgive other peoples uh, who have forgiven me. And if I am unable to forgive other people, then uh, God's not going to forgive me. So that's very, very important to have a forgiving heart. And then, thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That's the plan, folks. And so the third P is power. There is power, wonder-working power, 
in prayer. And understand that prayer is more than just a conversation with God. It's when God enters into our, our prayer time and we are confronting the devil. In that moment, God will show up. And the Bible says in the book of Acts, uh, when they prayed, they all raised their voices together in prayer. And the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they all were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God boldly. So the last P uh, in the five P's of prayer is the persons of prayer. Understanding that there is a Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And you can relate to each one of these in a different way. So with that being said, now you have the five P's of prayer. So with that being said, let's turn to um, 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. And let's study the plan that Jabez used in his prayer. The, uh, the prayer of Jabez. Look what it says. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. And so this is a plan that we can use in our own prayer life. And I've been studying the, uh, uh, the prayer of Jabez. I have purchased the book, and I would encourage you to do so. Uh, it was first published in, in the year uh, 2000, and it sold over 9 million copies. The author was Bruce Wilkerson. And Jabez's name actually means prayer. It's kind of like my boy named Sue. And so uh, as you study his prayer, he wasn't asking God to take the pain away from him. Um, he wasn't saying, Lord, take this pain from me. Instead, he went after the things that God had for him. He wasn't living in the past, and he wasn't going to continue to live with that name pain. He was going to trust God uh, for things that was going to happen to him that would fill him with hope. And so uh, he wasn't saying, take this pain from me. Instead, he was determined to go after the things that God had for him. It's very important, folks. A lot of times, our pain can hijack the real blessings that God wants to do with our life. Uh, chew on that for a while. Food for thought. Look what he said. He prayed for four things. Oh, that you would bless me, that you would enlarge my territory. Let your hand be upon me and keep me from harm. One translation says, keep me from evil so that I will be free from pain. And you can take these four things that Jabez prayed and uh, you can incorporate them into your own plan of prayer. Now stop and think about it for a moment, folks. Um, and a long list of 600 names, all of a sudden we find one who is given honorable mention. If you read uh, chapter, the first three chapters of, of um, First Chronicles and then get into chapter 4, uh, you find all of the begots. Uh, this person begot this person, and on and on uh, it goes. And then seemingly out of nowhere pops up Jabez, and God grants him what he requested. I say he was given honorable mention. And uh, this is the plan that you can use, plan that I'm going to use. Now you can uh, uh, pray this plan in one minute, or you can spend 20, 30, 40 minutes uh, on each item in this prayer. And so the first one I want you to see is this. 
Number one, a prayer for blessing. Praying for a blessing. Look what he said. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. In other words, Jabez was asking God to bless his socks off. And so God wants to bless you. God wants to bless me. And the word that is used in Scripture is the word prosper. Look at Psalm chapter 5 and verse 12. Oh, for you, O Lord, will bless the righteous with favor. You will surround him as with a shield. Folks, God really wants to bless you. The question is, why in the world does God want to bless you? Why does he want to bless me? Why does he want to bless people? The wrong answer is, well, just because God likes us and he wants us to have a lot of stuff. That is the wrong answer. Uh, the answer actually is found uh, in this word prosperity. So the word prosperity literally means in the Hebrew in which the Old Testament was written, uh, wherever you get on your own, God wants to push you further down the road. And so you are able to get here, but God wants to push you further in your spiritual life. Uh, now, you know, there's a reason why God wants to do that. And it's found in Genesis chapter 26, verses 12 through 13. Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. Verse 13, the man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. And so the question is, why does God want to prosper you? Why does he want to prosper me? Uh, well, the answer again is found in God's word in 3 John. He gives us the answer. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And so look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Look what it says. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing to others. And so here's something that we have to understand, folks. God doesn't want to just meet your needs. Uh, God wants to give you more than your needs so that you have something to give away, to bless other people. The worst thing that we can do is just pray for our own needs. Uh, don't just give me my needs, but give me more than I need, and I will take what I have, and I'm not going to just enjoy it myself. I'm going to use it to bless other people uh, in my relational world. And what this requires is for you and me to have a think big mentality. And so we need to uh, get away from a limiting uh, mindset into a an abundance mindset. And so Jabez, he was a man who was marked by pain. And he said, I will not live my life being marked by pain. God can bless me. He can give me more than I need so that I can be a blessing to other, peop to other people. This might be a new revelation for a lot of us. Don't just bless me with my needs, but give me more than my need so that I can be a blessing to other people. God doesn't want us just to live life. He wants us to live life of being a, uh, a blessing to other people. And so here's the prayer to pray. Lord, give me more than I need so I can be a blessing to the world around me. Here's the second prayer. Jabez prayed. He prayed for influence. I call this influence. He said, God, enlarge my territory. Now get this. All of these uh, are actually progressive. In other words, you can't pray this second prayer until you pray the first prayer. Uh, what you do with your blessing, uh, you use it to do more uh, than you're currently doing. 
And that word is influence. Enlarge my influence. All of us folks uh, are an influence, whether we realize it or not. Some of us have a good influence. Others have not so good of an influence. But Jabez prayed that God would enlarge his influence. Now, here's a verse that I'm sure we have read many, many times. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Look what it says. Now, to him who is able, highlight those three words, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. Now, folks, let me ask you a question. Do we just mouth this verse, or do we really allow it to sink in and resonate within our hearts? Do we really believe it, or do we just mouth the words? God is able. One of my favorite hymns of the church. He is able, more than able. God never intended for us to stay where we got started, folks, on our spiritual journey. God, Jabez prayed, give me more than I need. Then God enlarged my influence. So if God blesses you and if God enlarges uh, your center of influence, uh, then uh, uh, you're going to uh, need to ask God to do that. And here's the prayer. Lord, use me so that my life might make an eternal impact in the lives of other people. And folks, this has been what New Hope is all about these 36 years. Um, we want to, by the help of the Holy Spirit, make an impact upon the unchurched community. Such a man uh, walked into our church and he had, had been out of church for 40 years. But God touched his heart and he connected with God at New Hope. His name uh, was Milo Bloss. Uh, he began uh, his journey with God at New Hope. And uh, he actually, uh, at that time, we did not have a baptistry. We were leasing a building. I came across a beautiful uh, indoor baptistry. And uh, so uh, Milo... And his wife, Eileen, they actually went out and bought it. And we uh, drove up to Everett, Milo and I did, saw where they were being made. We loaded it into his uh, truck and brought it home, set it up. And Milo was the very first person to be baptized uh, in that new baptistry. And when he came up out of the water, his hands were raised and uh, rejoicing uh, in the Lord. Now, folks, uh, there are what is called foreign missions and, uh, and there are home missions. New Hope is a home mission church. Uh, we are targeting since day one unchurched people. And every once in a while we hit our target. And Milo was one of those guys uh, that... Uh, uh, turned on to Jesus uh, coming out of the unchurched community and started following uh, after Jesus. A thrilling story is his. And so, uh, if you get blessings, your influence is increased, you begin to let it sink in. Oh my goodness, this is really too big for me. That's why we need the third prayer. And here it is. Jabez prayed it. We can pray it too. Let your hand be upon me. And so what have we learned thus far? Jabez prayed a prayer of blessing. Prayed that his influence would increase. And prayed for the presence of God. So this is the hand of God that Jabez prayed that it would be upon him. Why did he pray this prayer? Simply because uh, we can't do it on our own power, folks. God takes us many times outside of our ability. 
And you know what God loves to do? What God really loves to do, uh, he loves to put his hand uh, upon you. He loves to put his hand upon people. And whenever God does that, whenever God places his hand upon people, it illustrates the presence of the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 11, verse 21. Look what it says. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned to the Lord. Why did that happen? How did that happen? Simply because the hand of the Lord uh, was upon them. And God wants to put his hand upon you. And God wants to put his hand upon me so that we can do what God has called us to do. Now, it's really interesting, folks, as you read and study uh, the scriptures, God loves to use uh, ordinary people to do uh, his work. And the Bible is full of such individuals. Um, and so here's, here's what we have learned. Uh, we step out of our comfort zone into something greater uh, in our lives, in our ministry, and uh, it involves our giving, it involves our serving, it involves our dreams, and sometimes uh, it makes us nervous. And actually, that's supposed to be that way. I gotta tell you something, folks. After preaching and teaching for uh, 57 years, 36 at New Hope, I still get nervous every time uh, I uh, give a message. And one of the things that I've learned from Dale Galloway, who once was the pastor of New Hope Community Church in Portland, and Robert Schuler, uh, who once pastored the Crystal Cathedral, uh, they talked about dreaming big dreams for God. Uh, Schuler even said, if you can dream it, you can do it. And so what God likes to do, he likes to take um, frail humanity and then he likes to put his hand upon them and, um, and uses them uh, to the furtherance of his kingdom. And he has done that throughout scriptures. Think about it for a moment, folks. The shepherds were a despised profession, but yet they were the first ones uh, to share the news that Christ had been born. Look at Moses. Moses was a wanted murderer, slow of speech, and yet God used him uh, to lead the Israelites out of slavery. Talk about Peter, a self-described sinful man, drops everything to follow Jesus and became a fisher of men. Why? Because God's hand was upon him. Look at Gideon, who was hiding in fear from the Midianites, became a mighty man of value. See where I'm going with this, folks? Esther, a young Jewish girl, became queen of Persia and saved her nation. Unlikely people. Think about David. He was number eight on the list. A shepherd boy becomes king of Israel. Look at Rahab, a prostitute, helps Israel inherit the promised land. And Saul, what about Saul, who became Paul, a religious leader who persecuted Christians, accepts Christ, and he writes much, much of our New Testament. And so, um, God uses unlikely people to further his kingdom. And God was notorious looking for people who didn't have the ability or the capacity on their own, and he chose them. He put his hand upon them. Then great things happened. And folks, that's the realm of Christianity. Uh, to be honest with you, that's what I want to experience. That's what I want you to experience. And I'm convinced the reason why God chose a guy like me who couldn't talk when he was in the first four elementary grades, uh, grades. he had a speech impediment, 
stuttered, stammered, couldn't pronounce his words clearly. When he talked, nobody was able to understand him. And uh, graduated from high school, had a tremendous inferiority complex. Uh, I was told that I was flunking out of college in the first quarter. The dean of the college said, Dale, you're wasting our time. You're wasting your dad's money. You're not college material. It's best you find another job, quit school, and go to work. Well, I got news for that guy. Uh, but God placed his hand upon me. I graduated from that school. I shook the hands of the dean who told me I would never... Uh, uh, be college material and got my diploma, went on and got another diploma at Warner Pacific University. But God's hand was upon me. The best that I could do, folks, to tell you the truth in school was get a C. I was happy to get a C. Uh, and I had a tremendous inferiority complex. I came out of my mother's room uh, with a inferiority complex. Nobody is more amazed than I am that I have been able to pastor and teach the scriptures for 57 years. April 9th, this year, will mark our 36th anniversary of New Hope. I don't understand it other than to say that God's hand has been upon me, and I say that in a very humble way and God wants to do that in your life he wants to place his hand upon your life uh, expand your influence so that you can make a difference in someone else's life for the cause of Christ and so in order for that to happen you've got to ask God for it and that's what Jabez did God I need you to bless me Bless me more than I need so that I can be a blessing to other people around me. And as we do that, uh, our sphere of influence uh, will enlarge. And thank God for technology because now, because of uh, online streaming uh, video on Facebook, uh, our influence has been expanded. And so, in one of my devotionals, I came across this devotional. Here's what it says. Lord, I am here. Speak to me and show me what you want to teach me. And this is what he taught me this week in one of my devotionals. You have been questioning yourself lately and wondering if you are really strong enough or good enough to do what I placed you to do in your heart. And so, let me remind you that you can do all things. Don't let fear talk you out of your dream. Remember, I am with you, and you will make it. You can do this. That so inspired me to keep on keeping on. And so, influence. It's all about making an impact for the cause of Christ in someone else's life. Let me ask you a question. Will anyone be in heaven because of you? Have you had the, the glorious opportunity of leading someone to Christ so that they will have a home in heaven when they die? Food for thought. Think it over. I want my influence, folks, to be expanded. Oftentimes I feel like I'm in over my head. And so I need God's hand upon me. I need his presence in my life. Folks, over these years, I have been so intimidated throughout my life. Growing up, I always felt inferior and I felt intimidated. I was a good basketball player. I played basketball when I was a uh, junior high school student up until my um, sophomore year in Toppenish. Dad moved his family to Yakima. I went from a small school to a large school. So I turned out for basketball. And I have to tell you something, folks. I was good. 
at basketball. I can make those three pointers. And so the uh, head coach of the A squad asked me to move up from the B squad to the A squad. But because of my inferiority complex, because I felt intimidated, I did not follow through on that. And the coach cut me from the squad. And so I came across this verse many years ago. It's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Look what it says. Now that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God, not us, not because of my degrees, but our sufficiency is from God. Verse 6 gets even better. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. I often quote Charles Spurgeon. He is known even to this day as the prince of preachers. He preached before large crowds. And on fast day, October 7, in um, the 1800s, middle 1800s, uh, he preached to the largest crowd ever, 23,654 people came at the Crystal Place in London and they listened to Charles Spurgeon preach. 23,000 people. But look what he said. Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preachers, said, I very frequently have to bemoan and mourn over my non-success and shortcomings as a preacher. Folks, I can say amen to Charles Spurgeon because oftentimes that's exactly the way I feel. But notice what the scripture says. The spirit gives life. Now, do you know what that word is in the Greek? The New Testament was written in Greek. And the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. And the word pneuma is the word for spirit in English. But that's not even the real world. It's one of those uh, words uh, that was so difficult for translations uh, and transla uh, translators to uh, translate that they didn't have a word for it. So they created the word spirit. But if you study the Greek dictionary, the word pneuma is translated. The actual closest word for it is breath or breathe. So you wouldn't want to call uh, the Godhead, Father, Son, and breath, or breathe, it just doesn't sound right. And But it's not even breath or breathe. You know, what, you know what it really means? It means, means to blow. And that's what it really means. The hymn writer wrote this beautiful hymn, Breathe on me, breath of God. It's the thing that you can't see. It's like the wind uh, your sails uh, that propels you. And where is that? Well, you can't see it. That's the word. And that's what the Holy Spirit is. He's the invisible force that you can't see. But I'm telling you something, folks. Uh, when he's there and what he does, he propels you to places because of the presence and the power and the hand of God and the breath of God and the wind of God is upon your life and we need that to do what he has called us to do. Here's the third prayer. Lord, be with me because what you have called me to do is too big for me. So, if you uh, get blessed, and now you have more than you need. Your life, uh, your influence has been expanded, and uh, God's hand 
is upon you. Uh, let me tell you the fourth thing that is going to happen. Um, you know what it is? All hell is going to break out. Uh, all hell is coming after you. Um, you know what? The devil doesn't mess with anybody who isn't doing anything. I mean, if you are not butting heads with the devil, chances are pretty good you're walking in step with him. But once you decide to go in the opposite direction that he is going in, it's going to happen all the time. Believe me, it will. And that's why this fourth prayer that he prayed uh, is a good prayer to pray. If all those first three things happens in your life, then we're going to need the fourth thing, and that is the prayer of protection. So, what have we learned? Jabez prayed for his blessings on his life, God's blessings on his life. He prayed for his influence to be expanded. Uh, he prayed for the hand of God to be upon his life. He prayed for the presence of God uh, to be upon his life. Uh, uh, Henry uh, Blackby wrote a beautiful book on practicing the presence of God. Good book to study in your devotional life. And number four, Jabez prayed for protection. And if we are going to get protection, we need to ask God for it. That God would keep me from evil, keep me from harm. Why is that? Simply because Satan is on the loose. Look what 1 Peter chapter uh, 5, verse 7 says. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Look at verse 9. It says, resist him, remain steadfast in the faith. Stand firm in your faith. Years ago, Mary Ann and I visited the zoo in San Francisco. It's a large zoo. And we went uh, right up next close to the uh, lion's cage. It was on a Monday. And the lion, big lion, ferocious lion, came right up to us at the cage. And uh, he opened his mouth. And he let out a roar that would deafen your ears. And I said to Marianne, I'm sure, sure glad there's a cage in front of us. That's how God describes Satan. He's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan only has three plays in his game book, folks. The Bible tells us the thief came to kill, steal, and to destroy. So what does that mean? He came to kill. Satan is a killjoy. He will kill your joy. He will steal your time. And he will completely destroy your life. Destroy your ministry. Destroy your family. Destroy your children. Destroy your grandchildren. That's his intent to do. And so we are to resist him and remain steadfast uh, in our faith. And when we do that, folks, we can overcome any demonic principality, uh, but we have to ask for it. As I begin to wrap up this message, let me tell you something. If I told you that tonight, that tonight there is somebody that is going to break into your home, and take everything of value that you have. I've got inside information that that's going to happen. And so tonight's tonight. And they're going to take everything of value. And uh, you wake up in the morning and it's gone. Your house has been ransacked. And thieves have stolen everything of value that you have. What are you going to do about it? I can tell you one thing that you're uh, not going to do. Uh, you won't be sleeping tonight. You'll probably be waiting for them, watching for them with two of your best friends, uh, Smith and Wesson. And uh, folks, you have an enemy who has every intention of destroying your life. 
Don't let that freak you out. Don't go to sleep. Remain steadfast in your faith. Don't be naive to it. Instead, use the weapons that God has given us. In the name of Jesus, the Bible says, there is power in the name of Jesus. Look at Psalms chapter 3, verses 1, 2, and 3. Lord, how they have increased who troubled me. Many are they who rise up against me. Many are they who say of me, there's no help for him. In God, Selah, which means stop, think it over. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory, and the one who lifts up my head. Look at Romans chapter 8, uh, verse 37 and 38. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. So this is a plan to pray. This is the fourth uh, plan to pray that it, Jabez prayed. Lord, strengthen me in the battle and rescue me from the battle. Because sometimes when we pray, uh, we're actually in it. Other times when we pray, we say, God, rescue me from it. I don't want it to, I don't want to ever be in it, folks. Neither do you. And so, to wrap up this message, uh, I'm including the prayer of Jabez as one of the plans that I use in my prayer life. God, I want you to give me more than I need so that my influence will be increased so that I will be able to be a blessing uh, to other people. Then I want you to have your hand to rest upon me. I can't do it on my own. I'm totally dependent upon the Holy Spirit. I'm going to need your help because what you have called me to do is too big for me to do it alone. Then the fourth prayer. I realize that we are in a spiritual uh, warfare. And so we pray, Lord, strengthen me and rescue me from every evil. So, God wants to use your life, folks. You're not to be praying just that he will meet your needs. New revelation. He wants to give you more than you need so that you can be a blessing to other people. And when I do that, he will enlarge my influence. And I find myself doing things I never thought that I was capable of doing because the hand of God was upon me. And so we find ourselves uh, in this uh, dilemma when I'm way over uh, my head. And so I'm asking God to help me. Then I'm asking God to uh, protect me. The Bible says that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So this prayer of Jabez is a plan that you can use in your own prayer life. And so you may be thinking, oh, Dale, if the truth were known, I really don't know that my heart is right with God. And I really don't know that uh, when I die, I have a home in heaven. But I would like to know. I would like to lead you in a prayer where you can know that you know that your heart is right with God and that you do have a home in heaven and that uh, God will place uh, his hand upon your life and will bless you beyond measure. The words are printed on the screen. I would encourage you to pray it with me. Just repeat it with me. Lord Jesus, 
I'm a sinner, but God, I'm sorry for my sin. I'm so sorry I want to change. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. And I confess them all to you right now. Come into my heart. Come into my life. And forgive me. Thank you for coming into my life. And thank you for saving me. So one final thought. Are you living the life God wants you to live? Or are you just passing through life? Uh, just living a life. God wants you to live a life that will bless other people. So I would encourage you to take a look at the prayer of Jabez and use it as one of your plans, one of your models in your prayer time. So may God be with you. Go with God and he will go with you. Oh
forever.